In today's lecture, we're going to talk about DNA and specifically focus on DNA as the genetic material. So I'd like to take you through uh, a little, uh, you know, reminisce a little on memory lane about the history of DNA, how it was discovered, and how we discovered it was the genetic material, discovered the structure of DNA. In the early 1900s, a uh, scientist by the name of Frederick Griffith, uh, so around the year 1909, 1913, I forget the exact date, but somewhere around that uh, time frame, uh, he discovered something called the principle of transformation. So in the, showing that genetic material could be passed from one organism to another within a peer group, within the same generation. So we're not talking about inheritance, right? We're talking about within a generation. He showed this in bacteria. It's very interesting. He showed this using a uh, Streptococcus bacteria, and he had two types of this bacteria. So the first type is he had a type 3S, which was a deadly type. So if you injected this bacteria into mice, the mice would die, and you would recover this deadly bacteria from the, the mouse's bloodstream. The idea being that it replicated out of control and killed the mouse. The other type was something called the 2R type, uh, subtype of the Streptococcus bacteria. Uh, this is indicated by blue, right? This is non-deadly. You injected this into the mice, the mice lived, nothing wrong with them, and you recovered no bacteria from their bloodstream because the immune system of the mouse, uh, in theory, destroyed the bacteria so you could not recover them afterwards. Okay, those are some control groups. Here's an extra control group. He took the 3S type, he heat killed them, right, so he boiled them, killed them all, and injected them into a mouse. The mouse lived because these bacteria are deadly, but if you kill the bacteria, they're not going to kill the mice. And no bacteria was recovered from the bloodstream because the mice, mouse's immune system uh, purged itself of, of these bacteria. Okay, so these are our three control groups. So nothing interesting too far, so, so far. But now you can see that what he did was he had his experimental group here. And this is where something very interesting happened. So basically what he did was he took a mixture of this second scenario, so column B, and this third scenario, column C. He mixed them together and the mouse died. So I say, what is going on here? So he took, again, the 2R bacteria that did not kill the mice, right? He took the heat killed 3S, the ones that did not kill the mice either. They're deadly, but they're, the bacteria are dead, so they didn't kill the mouse. He mixed them together, injected them, the mouse died. What did he recover? He recovered type 3S deadly bacteria. You might say, how the heck did he recover that? How did that happen? He didn't put live 3S in there, but he got them. So what he discovered, or what he proposed, was that something called transformation happened. In other words, uh, the 2R bacteria were alive, he heat killed the 3S, but whatever the genetic material was, he didn't kill that. He didn't denature that. And so that, although the bacteria were dead, their genetic material was passed from them to these non-deadly bacteria, these 2R, and in essence turned them deadly. Right? Now they have the genetic instructions uh, to make themselves deadly. I'm being a little vague. We'll talk about this more in a second. But, and then they killed the mice, and we recovered the 3S uh, version. He called this transformation, the passing of DNA from the 3S to the 2R. He called that transformation. Now some people said that maybe this isn't what happened. They said, you know, maybe just mutations happened. The 2R mutated into 3S. Well, Griffith said that's probably not likely because, uh, one, he repeated this experiment over and over and over again and always got the same result. It would be very odd and very weird if the 2R always mutated into 3S, right? Because there's other options, too. Why couldn't it mutate into 4S or uh, 2S or 1S? You sort of get the idea. The same thing wouldn't happen over and over again by chance. The other reason uh, he said that is because if 2R did mutate into 3S, it would be a double mutation in one generation that's beneficial. Uh, we had to turn from 2 to 3 and then from R to S. That would be very, very odd to have that happen in one generation. So Griffith said, no, transformation is what happened. Now, he did not know it was DNA at the time, right? But he just knew it was some genetic material. Okay, if you fast forward to the 1940s, uh, three scientists by the name of Avery McLeod and McCarty uh, showed that DNA actually was the transforming material. So these are the exact same uh, bacterial strain that Griffith used. And what they did was they took the deadly 3S bacteria, right? They cracked them open, they took the filtrate, and they separated it into three components, right? So they took the filtrate, they separated three components. Each of the three they exposed to a different enzyme to destroy a different macromolecule, and they wanted to see in which of these situations the transformation not occur. In other words, if transformation did not occur in a situation when you destroyed a given macromolecule, that must have meant that that macromolecule was the genetic material. 
You might say, okay, well, what were the candidates? Well, some people thought that RNA was the genetic material. So in one of the tubes, they put RNAs, an enzyme that destroys RNA. Some other people thought that proteins were the genetic material. So in that tube, they put a protease, an enzyme that destroys proteins. Another situation, people thought that maybe DNA was the genetic material. So in this tube, they put DNAs that destroys DNA. So they're destroying one macromolecule, either RNA, proteins, or DNA, right, in each of these three tubes. Then they're injecting that solution into these non-deadly bacterial strange, strains, and they want to see which of these three turn deadly. And so these are lined up in the same orientation over here. So these three are, are these three, right? Just these are a later, later point in time. You can see that the first scenario, we did get transformation to occur. The second scenario, we got transformation to occur. So now you see 3S, right? Um, if you destroy the RNA, but you still get transformation, then RNA must not be the genetic material. If you destroy proteins and you get transformation still, proteins must not be the genetic material. But look at the third tube here or the third flask. Here you destroy the DNA, you don't get transformation, so that's evidence that DNA must be the genetic material. Another group of scientists about the same time, um, Hershey and Chase, showed that DNA was also the genetic material, but showed in a slightly different way using uh, viruses that infect bacteria. This is how they did the experiment. So they basically took these, uh, these viruses and these bacteria and they grew them up either in a radioactive medium that was radioactive sulfur that labeled proteins, or they grew them up in a medium um, uh, that had um, uh, radioactive phosphorus, right, that labeled the DNA. And what they did was this. They knew that these bacteria, you know, infected, uh, sorry, these viruses infected these bacteria, right? And they wanted to see what was injected into the bacteria and what was left on the outside. Whatever was injected probably was the genetic material. And so what they saw was this. And again, we're seeing the experiment as they see the results, right? So they didn't really have, uh, <laughs> they didn't have these cartoon diagrams to help them through. So it might seem a little obvious now, but realize that they were working in the blind. So, so this is what we see here. You can see that we have, uh, here we have this bacterial, uh, sorry, this virus, right, infecting this bacteria. The DNA is right in the middle of the squiggly line. On the outside, you have this protein coat if sulfur, right, radioactive sulfur labels the protein coat, the radioactivity would stay on the outside, the DNA would be injected, it would not be radioactive. On the other hand, if, if the phosphorus labels the DNA with radioactivity, this radioactive strand of DNA would be injected inside the bacterium, and the non-radioactive protein coat would stay on the outside. Then what they did is they put each of these uh, flasks into a blender, right, or the contents of the flask into a blender, and zzz, they blended them up. Then what they did was they said, okay, where is the radioactivity? So they put them in a centrifuge, right, to pellet everything, to pellet the bacteria. You can see that in this left situation, which is left on this side, the radioactive sulfur remained in the supernatant. It's not in the pellets. In other words, the bacteria in the pellet, right, with the DNA, but it's not radioactive here. The protein coats of the viruses, when they were um, uh, blended, they were blended off. They were stripped off the bacterium. So the radioactivity, and they, they're very light, so they remain in the supernatant. So the radioactivity remained in the supernatant here, not in the pellet, and you can see that when they had viral offspring, they were not radioactive. So this is evidence suggesting that proteins are not the genetic material. So what's evidence suggesting that DNA is the genetic material? Well, when you look at this, you could see that, okay, the uh, DNA was injected in, it's radioactive, so when you pellet the bacteria, the bacterial pellet remains radioactive, right? The protein coats of the viruses are not radioactive, so the supernatant's not radioactive when you centrifuge, right? Because they're light, they stay on top. And you can see that when you have the next generation of viral offspring, they are radioactive as well. The fact that you can uh, find radio radioactivity in the pellet, that's the first point, and that you can find radioactivity in the next generation of the viruses shows that, uh, you know, that DNA probably was the, uh, the genetic information. Okay, which of these scientists did not provide direct uh, evidence that DNA was the genetic material? That's the first guy here that we talked about. So he's number four on this slide, right? Griffith. Uh, he showed that there was a genetic material that it could be transformed, but he didn't show it was DNA at all. So what are the requirements of genetic information? Does DNA meet all these requirements? Well, when the cell divides, each daughter cell must get an identical copy. DNA can do that. 
the genetic material must must have information content. DNA can do that, right? They have bases, A, T, C, G. You can write a code. Uh, there must be a mechanism for occasional mutations to occur. In other words, you want the DNA to copy, but you don't want to copy perfect every time. Uh, so the word we're looking for is fidelity. Uh, you want fidelity with your DNA replication. You want it to replicate, you know, for what it should replicate for, but you do not want complete fidelity. Uh, in a relationship, obviously, you'd want complete fidelity, right? You'd want your significant other to be faithful. But DNA replication, you don't want that. Uh, you want an occasional chance for error to happen, for mutation to occur, because that adds genetic diversity into the genetic pool. So does DNA meet all these requirements? Yes, it does. And let's look at how. There's four bases to DNA. There's A, G, T, and C, right? Uh, adenine, guanine, thymine, and cytosine. And uh, cytidine, excuse me. And um, there's two categories within them. So A and G are considered purines. And you want to, want to memorize the phrase pure as gold. You'll see that in a lot of MCAP uh, prep books. Pure as gold, as gold, right? So they're purines. Uh, T and C are pyrimidines. You'll notice that um, there's uh, that purines have two carbon rings in their base. Pyrimidines only have one. So it's very interesting. Uh, whenever you look at a nucleotide, just to label it, you can see that this here is called the base, or the nucleobase. This is the pentose sugar, and this is the phosphate for the phosphate backbone. This slide shows it a little bit uh, better here, actually. So here's our nucleobase. If you add the pentose sugar, we call that structure a nucleoside. Uh, once we start adding phosphates, we call them nucleotides, right? Either monophosphate, diphosphate, or triphosphate, depending on how many phosphates we have there. Um, the letters of DNA, again, are A, G, C, and T. Uh, RNA is identical, except that instead of having T's, we have U's. Right? So instead of having T's, we have U's. So this is an RNA. We have a U. Okay, uh, the nucleotides are connected by phosphate backbones, and we, we talk about the direction in terms of being a 5' prime to 3' prime direction. And we do this because uh, you'll probably remember from chemistry class that we can label carbons in a carbon ring. This is just saying the 5' prime carbon is here, the 3' prime carbon is here, so that's why it's the 5' prime to 3' prime end. So also in the 1940s, a scientist by the name of Shargoff made some observations of DNA to show which base is paired with which bases through hydrogen bonding. Um, he ended up discovering that the amount of T in a DNA double helix approximately equals the amount of A. The amount of G approximately equals the amount of C, so indicating that those two probably interact, right? T and A, G and C. And he showed some other math as well. So we're starting to see the structure of DNA. We're starting to see that they're made of bases, which bases interact together. Uh, quick little concept check question for you. Which of these has the lowest molecular weight? Obviously, it would be a nuclear base, right? The smallest component that we have here. Okay, let's look at how the final structure was put together. So uh, now we're entering into the 1950s, right? And a scientist by the name of Rosalind Franklin uh, was an expert in X-ray micro, uh, excuse me, X-ray diffraction imaging. Uh, and um, what she was able to do was she was able to shine X-ray sources. Uh, at DNA and get these X-ray diffraction patterns, right, to help show the structure of DNA. She was a key player. Uh, it's a very skilled uh, technique to be able to do. Uh, she was a key player in discovering uh, the structure of DNA. Now, she didn't put the whole thing together, right? We have to admit that. She didn't put all the pieces together. But um, the piece of information that she had was vital, and you would not be able to know the structure of DNA without her information. Uh, I mention this because um, a lot of people, well, most people probably universally agree that um, that she was not given the credit that she was due, you know, in discovering the structure of, of the DNA. Other scientists borrowed her data, use the word borrowed in quotes, uh, to help, you know, solve the puzzle. Okay, these are those other two scientists that I mentioned. So Watson and Crick, uh, in 1953, they published a paper based on Shargoff's ratios and uh, Rosalind Franklin's X-ray diffraction images, right? And it was published in Nature, a very short paper. I forget the exact length, one to three pages, something in that realm. Very, very short. Uh, and it was a phenomenal discovery, though. In biology, I would say probably the greatest discovery of the 20th century. Most people would agree. And what they showed was they showed that DNA has a double helix. There's two strands. They run anti-parallel. 
So in other words, if this one's five prime to three prime, this strand is three prime to five prime, right? So they showed that. Uh, they showed the bases are held together by hydrogen bonds. They also showed some dimensions of DNA. They hypothesized that the width of the double helix was about two nanometers and that the length of one turn of the double helix is about 3.4 nanometers or about 10 base pairs. So very phenomenal uh, discovery. Up until this point, some people thought the DNA was a, a triple helix. Uh, they thought that uh, maybe the bonding of the bases was on the outside of the backbone. Uh, so this was really a tremendous discovery. But again, most people agree that they did not give credit that was due to others in this process. So it's you know something to think about, sort of science ethics. Okay, another slide showing you here, a little more in depth on the hydrogen bonding. We have A interacting with T. Uh, they interact through two hydrogen bonds, so that's a weak interaction. Uh, G and C interact through three hydrogen bonds, that's a much stronger interaction. Remember, a given hydrogen bond is very weak, but together they're a strong force, so the more the better. So if you have a string of ATs uh, between two strands of a double helix, you have a bunch of those in a row, it's going to be a very weak interaction. Uh, the Gs and the Cs are the ones that give the strong interaction. Okay, again, just showing you another image. We covered this already, but a nice little image you know, showing the dimensions of DNA. If we look at DNA from the side, you can see that uh, DNA has a major groove and a minor groove. Uh, the major groove is sort of a wider um, gap, you know, as, as the phosphate backbone is turning around. The minor groove is a smaller gap. Uh, I mention these because in future lectures we'll talk about the significance of major and minor grooves in terms of binding of proteins. Okay, so a quick little concept check, a little math for you to do. Uh, so uh, DNA sequence, let's say it's 15 bases long. Approximately what's the length? Okay, so take a second, pause the video if you need to do and figure that out. Okay, remember you have to set up a proportion, right? You'll have to remember that uh, one turn or 10 base pairs is 3.4 nanometers. That's a given, right? You have to know that to start the problem. So if you say, well, what's a turn and a half? Well, there's a lot of ways to do this. You could set up proportions. Another way to simply do it is say 3.4 times 1.5, right? would be 5.1. So the answer is 5.1, number four. Okay, reviewing some of the structural features of DNA. Again, things we've covered, but just want to make sure that each of these rings a bell and understand how they're incorporated into the double helix. Okay, so does DNA fulfill all the requirements of genetic material that we started the lecture with? Does it have faithful replication? It does. Does it have information content? It does. Is the replication perfectly faithful? Bullet point number four, it's not, which is good, right? Because you need an ability to mutate. You have to be able to introduce genetic uh, diversity into the genetic pool. Okay, and here's a summary of the components of today's lecture. If you have any questions, please let me know.